in this webinar we'd be very grateful if you could make sure that your camera is off and that your microphone is off uh, for the next little while so we can allow uh, Michael to present his book. The format for the next hour or so is that uh, we are going to hear from Michael introduce the main themes of the book for 15-20 minutes or so and then going to abuse my right as chair to pose some questions to Michael picking up on some of the themes that I've identified through his work before throwing the event over to you to shape the questions and to shape the debate. You can contribute questions to this discussion uh, by typing them into the Q&A function. I'm sure you are all Zoom experts by now after a year of this, but you will find it at the foot of your screen in the middle, a Q&A box. If you click on that, you should be able to put your comments and questions in there. That will come through to the brilliant team uh, here at the Centre on Constitutional Change, where we'll be able to have a read through those questions and put as many as we can to Michael over the next hour or so. So I'm delighted to welcome Michael to introduce his new book, State and Nation in the United Kingdom, The Fractured Union. Uh, you will know, of course, that Michael is a prolific author. He's written numerous books on nationalism and independence, but he describes this as his first book about the union, um, which he describes not necessarily as a change of topic, but certainly a, a change of perspective. So, Michael, if I could in invite you to address that perspective for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. So, the United Kingdom is going through one of its regular paroxysms of agonizing about what it is, what is the union, will it stay together, will it fall apart? And in my career, I've been through many of these phases. In fact, they go back to the creation of the Anglo-Scottish Union back in the early uh, 18th century. At the moment, at one moment, the United Kingdom is going to sting together. It's solid, it's a nation, it's a state, uh, it's indestructible. And at the next moment, everybody says, it's going to fall apart. And, I try in this book to step back a little bit and take a longer term perspective on that, to look at what keeps the union together, why it goes through these periodic phases of reappraisal, and perhaps at the end to speculate upon the chances of its survival, although I'm not going to make any predictions whatsoever on that score. And to try and clarify what we mean by the union, I look first of all at unions generally. What, what is a union and what do we mean when we say that the United Kingdom is a union uh, as opposed to a unitary state? Or, or is it a unitary nation state? What, what is it? And rescuing this concept of unions from neglect, certainly in my own discipline, political science, and to some degree history and law uh, as well. And I identify four key items of a union, two elements by which we can distinguish a union from a nation state and use it as a key to understand the complexities of the state in which we live, the United Kingdom. And the first one, I, I like these Greek uh, alliterations here. So I talk about demos, telos and, and ethos. The demos is the people, is there a people? Is there a single people there? We talk about the British people, some people do, or are there multiple nations and multiple peoples within the union? So it's a way of conceiving of the nature of the political community. The second one is what I call telos. Is there a purpose to the union? We talk about this a great deal in the context of the European Union, and I'm going to argue that it has parallels with the United Kingdom. And when we go through these paroxysms of agonizing about the United Kingdom, we ask, what is its purpose? Is, does it have a shared purpose in the past and in the present? The third one is what I call ethos, and that is about common values, to have a a state or a union or a nation, do you have to have common values? Do these values have to be peculiar to your own nation or can you share values with uh, other nations? And finally, there's the notion of sovereignty that in a nation state, traditionally there is one locus of sovereignty. It may be the people conceived of as a unitary people. It may be the monarch in the past. It may be the monarch in parliament to use the British formula, but it's all in one place. Whereas in a union, sovereignty can be dispersed and discovered and reinvented in all sorts of places. And there are continuing debates about the nature of sovereignty rather than being one single point. If we look at it that way, then a nation state has a unity of demos, telos, ethos, and sovereignty. Whereas in a nation, all of these things are up to, to play. And in the historical chapter, then I use this as a framework to think about the nature of the United Kingdom. It doesn't follow a single teleology. Uh, we 
well, people of my generation were brought up on the Whig historians where everything is progress and, and unity. We now know that history doesn't go in straight lines. It comes backwards and forwards and moves sideways. And in the history of the United Kingdom, these things, these themes have, have always been up uh, to play there. But if that's the union or the unions, because of course the union with Ireland and England and the union of uh, England and Scotland and, and Wales's place in that, indeed England's own place in the union are all very different. Uh, what is unionism? Uh, is there an ideology? Would we have a national ideology of, of Britain or, or the United Kingdom, to take it a little bit more broadly? And I argue here that yes, there are unionisms, but they're multiple. There's not just one unionism. There are different unions in the different parts of the United Kingdom and different unionisms. And that we can see some unionisms are assimilative, like the French Jacobin notion that we must eliminate national differences. There's an element of that in British history of trying to assimilate to a single model, uh, both the left and the right, but rather more on the left than on the right. There's what I call a patriotic unionism, which is the idea that you can be a very patriotic uh, Welshman or Scotswoman, uh, but at the same time be British. It's, it's by being British, by being in favor of the union, you express uh, your national uh, identity. This used to be very common on, on both sides of the Irish Sea and across the United Kingdom. There is a conditional unionism, a contractual unionism, I call it, that is, we are loyal to the union on condition that the union accepts the deal. This was a bargain. So we go back to the union of 1707 and engage in understanding what the people there were saying. Uh, there are traditions of contractual unionism in Scotland. And people talk about the Declaration of Arbrose. <laughs> I don't want to go there because these historical uh, interpretations are always contentious. But people go into history and say, this is our understanding of the union. There were conditions there. We didn't just sign a blank check. And then, of course, there's the Scottish covenant tradition, which comes from Protestantism and the Old Testament, is exported over to Northern Ireland, where it becomes a strong element of Ulster unionism. Yes, we're loyal to the union as long as you are loyal to, to the bargain there. Uh, that's an important uh, element. Uh, and then there's what I call neo-unionism. Uh, I'm glad to see the report in today's paper that the term seem to have caught on, but I invented this about 20 years ago after devolution, as what happens to unionism uh, after devolution. Well, the one thing that these unionisms had in common was a belief in parliamentary sovereignty. And this peculiar thing about British unionism was that it was extremely tolerant about the idea of having multiple nations and multiple identities. I work a lot on Spain and the idea that Catalonia can call itself a, a nation preoccupied the constitutional course for all of four years before it decided you couldn't call yourself a nation. The UK has been very relaxed about those kinds of things, but UK unionism does draw the line at parliamentary sovereignty. That's the thing that holds it all together. In the past, maybe the monarchy serve that role. But now it's all about parliamentary sovereignty. And mostly that was taken to preclude home rule or devolved parliaments. I say mostly because not all unionists were anti-devolution. But there was a feeling that you give recognition to the nations plus political autonomy, then you've lost the union. You can't do both at the same time. Until the very end of the 20th century, when this long running argument about home rule that had been going on for about 130 years or even 150 years was suddenly resolved overnight with devolved legislatures in all three of the smaller territories uh, but no agreement on what the basis of it was uh, and I have a chapter then looking at interpretations of what is devolution all about because on the one hand we have the Westminster argument that Westminster is by definition sovereign, can't give its sovereignty away. So all it has done has lent authority to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, which can be taken back at any time. It may be politically imprudent to try and take it back, but, but it, it, it could be done. As against what I call a very different epistem epistemic argument, which is, well, that's what you say, but we have a different interpretation. And the counter argument is not a single doctrine, but a whole, conjuries of different kinds of ways of thinking about the constitution, starting off with questioning parliamentary sovereignty, which is a, basically a tautology. Parliament is sovereign because by virtue of its sovereign authority, it says it's sovereign. Uh, once you start questioning that, then you've got to look at other sources of authority. 
well, there's the Scottish legal tradition that the late Neil McCormack used to write about. Uh, there's the uh, understandings of devolution as an act of self-determination because there were referendums. There's the Scottish claim of right, which the almost the entire parliamentary Labour Party signed on to and then tried to reinterpret it in various ways. There's all sorts of pronouncements by judges, normally over to dicta, that is not affecting the resolution of the case, saying, well, maybe following devolution and indeed at that time EU membership, we need to rethink that notion of parliamentary sovereignty. And various lectures and academic writings of judges saying, yes, there's very good grounds for thinking that the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty must be changed and that we have here a plurinational quasi-federal kind of systems. But the Westminster Parliament and the Supreme Court simply don't accept that. It was joined famously in the uh, first Miller case when the Supreme Court said that the Legislative Consent Convention was not binding. Effectively, it was siding with the Westminster interpretation of the Constitution. But I'd rather say that argument is open. The argument about sovereignty is, is, is really quite open. And for 20 years, we muddled through because most of the time these things don't really matter and politics managed to resolve them. But there was always that fundamental questioning of the constitution and arguably that goes back to the origins of the union uh, itself because these arguments are not totally new until Brexit, along comes Brexit, uh, which really forces the issue because the essential premise for Brexit was to take back control. Now, initially that was to parliament and then it became the British people. But for my argument, it doesn't really matter which it is. It's taking power and sovereignty back to what is conceived of as a unitary nation state with a single demos, a telos, an ethos, and a single point of sovereignty. Whereas many, many people, and not just nationalists, don't think that is the way the United Kingdom operates. I say not just nationalists, because we're seeing that also unionism is very exercised about this and, and reverting to notions of contractual loyalty and we signed a bargain and the bargain wasn't respected and so on and therefore uh, we want to question what parliament has done. So Brexit really is the big test of the union and my, my argument which I've deployed in various places is that the United Kingdom can be conceived of not as a unitary state but as a plurinational uh, union uh, involving in a quasi-federal direction without a single demos telos, ethos, or point of sovereignty. And that is exactly what the European Union is. So far from being incompatible with the British constitution, the membership of the European Union reflected that understanding of the British constitution very well. And in all kinds of practical ways, the European Union did provide for a more extensive devolution settlement within the United Kingdom than would otherwise have been possible. So Brexit has provoked this great crisis, but Something, something was going to happen. Uh, something was going to challenge those confused understandings of the nature of what devolution was about. But had we remained in the European Union, uh, there wouldn't have been a crisis. We would have continued to muddle through and argue and, and develop, as I think, shared understandings that the constitution was changing. So what happens as a result of this? Well, unionism then, uh, I see as reinventing itself. This, challenge was first placed with devolution. Once unionism accepts devolution, what does it do? Uh, it develops a, what I call a neo-unionism. Uh, once you accept subordinate legislatures, once you accept legislative devolution, where do you draw the line? Uh, and I argue that unionism has been really quite generous in successive Labour and Conservative governments in devolving power or, or so competences, legislative competences to the smaller nations, but at the same time is double down on the principle of sovereignty, uh, and <clears throat> insisting in an almost exaggerated way, a quite a historical way, on the unity of the central Westminster Parliament. And that's what Brexit has done, because Brexit has been met, or the, the response of the smaller nations to Brexit has been met with the argument that we are a unitary state, uh, I saw that in the government white paper in the summer of last year. I hadn't seen it for a while. We are a unitary state. We are a unitary nation and everything follows from that. This is a kind of neo-unionism uh, and unionism then having lost 
its anchoring in the traditional understandings has, and, and faced with challenges from the peripheral nationalisms, has now become a nationalism itself. That is an insistence that there is a British nation, a British people, rather than multiple peoples that don't need to be defined and nailed down. I got quite, the British people have voted for Brexit, for example. What, what, what does that mean? Just unpick that one for a moment. That there's a single telos, so we're continually thinking, what is the purpose of Britain? What is the purpose of the United Kingdom? As though there was a single purpose. Well, we have these arguments in spades in the European Union all the time. Is it social? Is it economic? Is it diplomatic? Is it military and, uh, and so on? No, no, we have to nail down these. We'll never agree on that. Uh, and that there's a single ethos, that is Britishness, uh, in which the what are universal values of human rights and democracy and so on are appropriated by the union and they are Britishness. They're the higher values and the smaller nations, sure, they can tolerate, they can be tolerated, they have their own traditions and the competences and powers and so on, but all the higher values belong at the British level. Now, the problem with the Britishness debate is not that these values are universal because many national projects are based upon universal values. It's that they're exactly the same values as are espoused by the periphery, because I don't know any uh, Scottish or Welsh or these days Irish nationalists who don't believe in democracy and, and freedom and, and all the rest of it. So saying that is the basis of the union is becomes, becomes problematic. So we have then this crisis of uh, the union. We have uh, powerful centrifugal forces that are drawing the peripheral parts of the United Kingdom into international European networks while the center in England is going in a different direction. People are saying, well, the union will fall apart, to which I say, well, hold on a moment. There are powerful things keeping the union together. There's a powerful shared sense of shared history, even in the Republic of Ireland, and I, I speak as an Irish citizen, uh, they, 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 there are powerful notions, as long as you don't call it Britishness, as long as you don't force it on people, as long as you don't have all this flag waving, obligatory Britishness, then the union, it seems to me, can work perfectly well. So unionism is then becoming a, a, a nationalism, which is counterproductive, and it will destroy itself. And in the meanwhile, the scenario of the United Kingdom falling apart neatly into its components parts, that's not going to happen either. Think about Scottish independence in Europe and what you do about the border. Uh, think, look at what's happening in Northern Ireland at the moment, uh, where there's no neat, tidy solution. So that's why I get the metaphor of a fracture. And I looked this up in a medical textbook. Uh, uh, you could have multiple fractures in one of your bones, but as long as they don't, they're not all in the same place uh, and they won't all fall apart. So unionism has many, many strands and it's stayed together for hundreds of years because of these strands. And one strand can weaken and the other strand will take the strain. But if unionism just becomes one thing, when that one strand breaks, the union is finished. So I think unionists really have to rethink, go back to understandings of what the union is, which is my argument that the greatest threat to the United Kingdom at the moment is not probably not the nationalists, but it's the unionists, unionists and where unionism itself has come. Thank you, so back to you, Kezia. Thank you, Michael, for such a, a great overview of what is a very important book. You um, mentioned briefly at the start that there are 11 chapters to this book, which don't necessarily follow a chronology. They're each in turn a different theme, which you explore. And we've, we've covered a few of those uh, in the introduction. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions now, but just a little reminder to those people who are watching that they too can contribute to the debate. Uh, we've had one question in so far, but if you'd like to add to that list, you can do so by uh, hitting the Q&A button below and typing that question in and we'll try and get through as many of those uh, as we can over the next wee while. Um, but now it's my turn, Michael, to, to put some questions your way. And, and the first thing I, I really wanted to explore with you was um, what you say quite early on in the book around the nature of political unions having to demonstrate their utility and their legitimacy. And you describe how political unions often start with a need for security. Uh, and many unions also share this idea of economic integration. So my, my first question to you was, to what degree do you think there still is that economic integration across the United Kingdom uh, and separately when it comes to something like the welfare state do you think if the welfare state was stronger or renewed the union itself would be in a better position
Thanks for that, Kez, because there are chapters devoted to each of those themes. In, in some senses, the United Kingdom was an economic union as a result of the unions for its time. In the 18th century and the 19th century, what you meant by an economic union is really a free trade area. In the context of a modern regulated economy, uh, is it? Well, yes, to a high degree it is, but since devolution, there's been a lot of devolution of economic regulatory functions or functions that can have economic implications, but within the European framework and following Brexit then, to what sense is, is the United Kingdom an economic union? Uh, it lacks two key elements. And one is a regulatory union, which is why the UK government has adopted the UK Internal Market Bill, which is an admission that the United Kingdom is not itself an economic union. And the Internal Market Bill has been highly problematic. And the other is what I call, what, it lacks what the, is called in European parlance, territorial cohesion. Now, about 20 years ago, the EU adopted the theme of territorial cohesion along with economic and social cohesion, which meant a commitment to balancing out activity across the United Kingdom, uh, sorry, across the European Union. The United Kingdom abandoned that goal in the 1980s, regional policy disappeared. There is no UK-wide regional policy anymore. There's a lot of talk about this leveling up end, uh, agenda. The resources so far seem to be nothing like the commitment that was put into that in the 1960s and 1970s. So we have a union this government that talks about economic union. It doesn't really do very much about it. As far as social union is concerned, yes, there's a great deal of sharing the social welfare system is highly redistributive and Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are net beneficiaries. Uh, on the other hand, there is no equalization formula. We've got the Barnett formula, but resources are not distributed according to need and never have been. And the Barnett formula doesn't do that except for a tiny clause to do with Wales. Uh, and the other services, the National Health Service, for example, is, is already uh, devolved. So the idea that the UK is a sharing union, yes, it's true, but don't push it too far. Uh, get it, get, you've got to get that absolutely correct. And in any case, I don't see any evidence that if Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland separate, well, let's leave Northern Ireland apart because the Irish have problems with their health service, but if Scotland and Wales went their own ways, I don't think they abolish their national health services. I don't think it's the union that, 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 that provides that, and it would be just as well uh, to admit that. So there are variations. Yes, economic and social union, but I try and examine that and pick it and ask to what degree is that actually true? I'm going to move on to a slightly different question in a second, but I just want to pick up from one of the audience questions, which is connected to what we've just been discussing there from Violet, who says, what is the influence of the neoliberal economy on the union? Does it not divide? So this idea that, you know, austerity itself might be a threat to the union. Indeed, because the high point of the union was probably in the post-war years when the UK government assumed responsibility for economic growth, full employment and eventually territorial balance across the UK. This was also the time of the, of the welfare state. And what happened in the 1980s, well, you had a government that was profoundly nationalistic in a British sense, profoundly committed to the British nation, but dismantling many of the institutions that actually made that real. Now, the welfare state was not dismantled, but it was radically changed from being based upon social citizenship to being a residual system for, for the poor. Uh, and the loss of that notion of social citizenship, I think, does undercut one of the meanings of the union. And one of my favorite anecdotes is uh, seeing Margaret Thatcher uh, putting her handkerchief over the tail fin of a British Airways aircraft because she wanted to put the union flag back on that uh, aircraft. Uh, she herself had privatized that airline. So, so how is that in any sense somehow a symbol of, of, of the nation. Uh, once you turn things over to the market, I'm not saying you know, privatization itself is either good or bad, but once you roll things over to the market and bring in international capital, you are undercutting one of the strands of, of the union. And that indeed was done in the 1980s. 
you touched on this in your, your introduction, but there was one sentence in the book that really stood out to me as making me think, quite a provocative statement, and I hope other people who are watching would, would likewise consider it so. You say, unionism has become a nationalism rather than a mode of government. And I don't even know if you know this, Michael, because we've been chatting for the past 20 minutes, but I just happened to have a look at Twitter, and in the last 20 minutes or so, uh, the UK government has announced that it's going to take the Scottish Parliament to, to court over two pieces of legislation which it believes have gone beyond its powers. And that strikes me um, as an example of this muscular unionism that you, you describe as evolving since devolution. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about that idea of neo-unionism uh, and how it's playing out in 2021. So one of those bills was the, the Children's Rights Bill that, that the UK government are now taking the Scottish Parliament to court over. Uh, yes, we could, we, we could talk about rights as well. That's, but that, that is really interesting because one of the things that's happened since devolution is that rights have been assured mainly through the European Convention, which takes them out of the context of the national context altogether. And I think that was extremely helpful to, to manage devolution, but they're not tied with, up with Britishness. And the attempt to incorporate these other international conventions would do the same thing. As far as British nationalism is concerned, of course, there's always been a British nationalism in the external dimension during the wars, during the empire and so on. Yes, looking outwards, there was a strong sense of being British, but on the inwards, the British national, the notion of a British nation was combined with a broad recognition that there are other nations as well. Uh, uh, and that we never had anything like the French program of socialization, uh, a unified centralized education system, military service used to build the nations. We had, regiments representing Scotland and Wales and Ireland. There was, there was diversity built in in all kinds of ways. So unionism was able to uh, accommodate that. But the argument now that there are British values and a British flag must be put on things like democracy and, and welfare and social cohesion, that's converting it into a nationalism in, 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 in its own right, which it never was. And just as a, a secondary question from Niall Thomas, what does a Goldilocks unionism look like? And his definition is somewhere between a banal and muscular unionism. Is it possible? It's a matter of statecraft. It's not so much an ideology, because it's very difficult to write a lot of this down. But unionism has had its success and it's had its failures. It had a disastrous failure in Ireland. We know it didn't work. In Scotland, it was, it was mostly a success, but it accommodated various aspects of Scottish nationality. In the 18th century, it was more important to keep your own religious settlement than your parliament, for example, according to the, uh, the, the dominant political forces within Scotland at, at that time. Uh, and the, the UK then became one of the very, very few European countries that tolerated limit, to a limited extent. Uh, that had, let's put it this way, that had different established churches. Uh, they, they were extremely intolerant with regard to Catholicism. Uh, and, and, and that has to be said, that the, 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 the Union settlements were highly sectarian, and, and that explains the failure in Ireland. But within Protestantism, uh, there was a greater degree of latitude than we see in, 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 in many other countries. And so a Unionism needs to be aware of that uh, and recognise that it can take multiple forms in, in different places. Now, from if you're a Cartesian or nationalist who likes everything to be consistent, this looks terribly untidy, uh, but, it, but it worked most of the time and it adjusts over time. Devolution was a big adjustment in the terms of the, of, of the union. So it's a practice, I'd call it, it's a statecraft, it's a way of governing rather than a single ideology. Another question here from Oliver Escobar, who says, how do those different unionisms map onto party politics? And does that matter for the future of the union? Ah, uh, yeah, but, but that's a very good question because they don't neatly map uh, on, on, onto party politics at all. Uh, uh, historically, the Liberal Party and then the Labour Party were uh, pro-home rule, although the Labour Party forgot about it most of the time when it was in government and the Conservative Party were more strongly in favour of the unitary uh, or, or parliamentary sovereignty and, and the home rule. But there were variations within those parties, really important variations. Within the Conservative Party, there was these 
patriotic unionism that we find in, in Scotland, which was extremely important in Scotland. In fact, we forget that in the mid 1950s, the Conservatives were the biggest party in Scotland. They didn't call themselves Conservatives, they called themselves Unionists. This was just patriotic unionism. The Labour Party had its home rule wing, but it also had its very, very centralizing wing because they talked about the primacy of, of class. Uh, and even nationalism itself, there have been several nationalist parties. Now we've got the SNP, and we know they themselves uh, are not uh, agreed on exactly what kind of reconfiguration of, of the political order across these islands uh, they, they, they would go for. Uh, they've adopted Europe now, but what is their relationship with the United Kingdom? Uh, what are the implications of joining, of, of keeping the pounds sterling, uh, for example? So no, there's, there's, it doesn't map onto party politics. Uh, and it's problematic now that since this has become this cleavage line in British politics, uh, sorry, Scottish politics, it, it has become the main division. We have a lot of evidence of that within the electorate. Uh, but that doesn't mean the electors have an easy choice because it's not quite clear where all the parties fit on this. The Labour Party is clearly the most conflicted. Conservatives have decided where they stand. The Labour Party is conflicted because its, it's, it's voters are divided on these issues. I would, I'm desperate to offer my own opinion on, on that one, but I'll resist oh, yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I can see you're tempting me to do so. There, there may be time for that later on, but this is about your book, so I will, I will swallow uh, that thought and just move on a second. We're getting quite a few questions around federalism, which I want to discuss with you next, Michael, and also many, many questions about Brexit, and we will get to those, but let's just uh, move on to the topic of, of, of federalism, and you do address this in the book, and I was very pleased to see it there as somebody who's never defined as either a unionist or a national nationalist. There are lots of people across the country who believe in a, a federalist solution for the United Kingdom. A question from Derek Johnston says, what does your analysis lead you to conclude about the possible federal solutions? Well, well federalism is admirably described by my uh, colleague at Edinburgh, Alvin Jackson, as, as the wonder drug, constitutional <laughs> wonder drug. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've been studying this for a very long time. And whenever parties get into trouble, they reach for the federal wonder drug. And I've never ever seen it defined. Uh, I've only seen it defined once, and that was by Joseph Chamberlain back in the uh, late 1880s in response to Gladstone's bill. And he wrote a very interesting little book about federalism. And he said, well, of course, it's not really federalism because I still have parliamentary sovereignty. <laughs> uh, so, and, and since then, if we're gonna have a federal system, you have to do two things. One is you have to have a constitutional settlement which restrains the Westminster government as well as the devolved governments. There's no federal system that restrains one level, but not the other. That's not federalism. Uh, so the Westminster government would not be able to legislate within devolved fields. Uh, this would be judicially enforceable. And the second thing you got to do is do something about England. And having an English parliament isn't going to work because English people don't want that. And how can we enforce federalism on the English? when they don't want it. Now, when we complained for years that we couldn't have the solution that we wanted. Uh, regionalizing England, that's not going to be federalism because whatever city regions or provinces or whatever you have in England, they're not going to have the same status as the Scottish or Welsh parliaments. The Northern Ireland settlement is quite different again. So until somebody answers those questions, and I've read all the recent contributions about federalism and they don't answer those questions, then federalism or federation is not the answer. On the other hand, the federal principle, federal thinking, I think is, is, is highly relevant. And we could have a more federalizing interpretation of what we've got. I don't mean federation, that requires home rule all around, but a federal interpretation of the relationship between the Scottish Parliament and Westminster, that is a non-hierarchical interpretation uh, and understanding that sovereignty is uh, dispersed. Uh, you could have, you could change the Sewell Convention to make it not only statutory, but, but binding. So that would give a more, introduce some of these federal elements without thinking that a federal solution is going to resolve the problem of the United Kingdom. As for England, which has to be part of any overall solution, until the English decide what the question is, then we can't really do anything, let alone the answer. What, what is the question? There is an English question. There certainly is but we don't know quite what it is until we can decide what it is. And it's very difficult to think about how we can have uh, an answer, but we're not gonna change the whole constitution of the United Kingdom 
just to solve the problem of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland without England being on board. Yeah, I, I could debate with you whether the uh, problem with federalism is a lack of definition or the fact that there are many definitions, but we'll, we'll resist the temptation to, to do that as well. We've got a follow on question from, from Jim Gallagher. And um, he says, Michael, I agree with you that it's British or more accurately English nationalism that's the bigger threat to the UK as a union. He disagrees, however, that the UK is not an economic union and he describes that as nonsense, I'm afraid. He says there are huge fiscal transfers, single currency, single labour market. You'll not be surprised that, to see these as the views of, of Jim Gallagher. But he closes with your last remark saying the question is what to do about England. And if I could just challenge you back on, on your last remark there around, you know, no appetite for a, an English parliament. I think that's that's right. And that's there's evidence for that. But I'm not sure we can assume that there isn't an appetite in England for greater agency, greater voice and, and greater devolution. In fact, even throughout the last 12 months of the pandemic, we, we've seen the value and the power and the worth, for example, of mayors uh, across England. You know, Andy Burnham giving the, the North West a very strong voice uh, during the uh, initial economic uh, collapse around the, the pandemic. Just wonder if you think there is an answer that increases an appetite for a devolution within England. It's just about the language that we use to talk about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's always good to argue with Jim. So on, 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 on the first... On his first point, what I'm saying is that there are many dimensions to economic union uh, and the United Kingdom doesn't have all of those. If it did, we wouldn't have the internal market bill. That is a recognition that there is a lack of an internal market once you take the uh, EU framework away. Of course, there, there, are labor, there, there, are, there, there are many more transactions within the United Kingdom than there are across the borders of the United Kingdom. If you want to conceptualize an economic union that way. Uh, yes, there is a single uh, integrated uh, labour market, more or less, not, not perfect, more, more, more or less. But there are other elements that are lacking, and, and, and unionism seems to be aware of that, hence the internal market bill, hence this rather incoherent talk about levelling up, which doesn't seem to strike me as a coherent territorial policy, but just as a recognition that there's an increasingly territorialised concern with economic inequalities. Uh, what to do about England? Uh, yes, uh, I agree with you, Kez. There is an English question. We just don't know exactly what it is. But, but there's a lot of discontent there. Uh, a lot of things have come into that mix there. Uh, some of the answer to that clearly is decentralization, is Whitehall letting go. That, that, that's clearly a, a desire, wanting to do things themselves. Uh, there's the inefficiency of centralized government. And then there's the notion that England somehow doesn't have a voice because it doesn't have institutions of its own separate from the United Kingdom. And the question is then, how can you get that English voice? How can you give expression to that English voice without going for an English parliament to be very difficult to coexist with the Westminster parliament? And there's a lot of interesting work going on around England. Uh, there's, there's, there's a debate there going on, but it hasn't crystallized in the way the Scottish debate crystallized in the 1990s, well, so we'll have a devolved parliament. At the time, wide consensus on that. The English debate hasn't got there yet, and then until it does get there, then it's very difficult to see what the policy response should be. Just, just one more question on, on federalism, and then we'll, we'll dive into Brexit. So this comes from Mike Picken and Paisley. I'm going to read the full thing out because it's... Uh, uh, very, very astute point, I think. The idea of creating a federal UK is being re-raised by the Liberal Democrats and elements within Labour as an alternative to the status quo. But as genuine federalism fundamentally challenges the notion of parliamentary sovereignty that lies at the heart of the current state settlement, is federalism actually even more idealistic and actually less realistic than the path to independence for Scotland and the reunification of Ireland, both of which seem to be more likely and at least have clear route maps from the form of the Edinburgh and Good Friday Agreement. So, so, so there's a proposition for you. Federalism would be harder to achieve than independence. Well, yeah, I can, I can, I can see the point. Uh, I, I wouldn't go quite that far necessarily because <laughs> independence itself would be very complicated and very messy uh, and would not draw boundaries clearly in the, in, in, in the same place. The notion of independence means classically the economic boundary, the social boundary, the political boundary and so on are all in the same place. It's just very difficult to see that happening for the reasons I explained uh, earlier on. So yeah, the first point that was made by the questioner was 
federalism means challenging parliamentary sovereignty. It does, it does. And in a way, I think we were getting there because just a few years ago, people were able to say, well, this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, it doesn't really matter because Westminster doesn't really trample on the devolved settlements all the time. Uh, and have we lost sovereignty to Europe? Well, in practice, the UK has hardly ever been overruled in Europe. So what's the argument about sovereignty anyway? And, uh, and the UK has got its way within the European Union probably more than any other member state since, since it joined. The creation of the European single market, for example, was a UK achievement. Uh, but it is beginning to matter now. Uh, so suddenly sovereignty does seem to matter, not just because the nationalists are opposing it, but because the unionists themselves, or some sections of unionists, Brexit unionism is all about sovereignty. And we know that the negotiations about Brexit following the referendum were just dominated with an absolute obsession with, with sovereignty. Uh, and it was sovereignty considerations rather than economic considerations that explains the position of the UK government and the final outcome. Just, just sticking with Brexit, uh, a question here from David Guy, who says, is the Brexit effect on the union quasi-permanent or will Brexit fatigue set in to the extent that the impetus it gave to no voters of 2014 Remainers to switch to yes simply runs out of steam and we all get used to being out of Europe. I've seen some interesting polling on this, Michael, but I'd be intrigued to hear your opinion first. Well, yeah, you mentioned polls there. We, we plan to do some more survey work on this just, just, just in, the, in the months to come, really after the election. And one argument is yes, we'll get over Brexit and we'll settle down again. But the other argument is that this alignment over Brexit increasingly coincides with the alignment of voters around independence. It didn't really, in 2016. There was no relationship. Both nationalists and unionists voted overwhelmingly to remain. Very little difference. That has changed. Uh, and we're getting, you see, right across the world now, politics revolving not around the traditional class or economic issues, but around questions of identity. Uh, and that is happening in Scotland. So that alignment of being, feeling 100% Scottish, not British, voting for the pro-independence parties uh, and uh, supporting European integration. That effect is, we're seeing that effect, which suggests that this is a clear view that's not gonna go away again. Europe will remain part of that mix. Now, uh, it all depends on what's gonna happen by Scotland with regard to Europe, the UK government has not only taken a rather hard Brexit position, but it's also constrained the ability of the Scottish Parliament to remain aligned with European uh, regulations and laws. This is part of the internal market bill. So all sorts of issues are gonna come up there. There's the Erasmus exchange scheme. All sorts of things are gonna come up where Scotland might say, well, why can't we be part of that? Mm. Why do we have to follow the British line within, within devolved competences and some as well? So no, I, I, I don't see this one going away in, in, in the short term. If I were answering that, that question from David, I would point him to some recent survey work I've seen by the organisation Together, who've just done a, a huge survey of UK public opinion, which actually shows attitudes to Brexit fading quite considerably and far faster than attitudes to the constitutional question in Scotland did in, in 2014. But at the same time, the, the reversal of, of that is to look at the, the travel of voters in Scotland from no to yes in the last 22 opinion polls, which show uh, by far and away the, the biggest group of people moving from no to yes are those who were staunchly remain uh, in the last EU, EU referendum. So you can you can take your mix from your pick from the polls in, in that sense. Uh, another question in here from Kirsty Hughes, who says Brexit, as you say, has had a huge impact. Can the UK easily manage a reversion to multiple identity union if it remains outside the EU and, as the current government is, is actively hostile to European identities and relationships? We'll, we'll, we'll just have to see, but certainly Europe did play into this identity game in the sense that it provided yet another level of, of identity. Scots are used to being British and Scottish at the same time. People didn't find uh, people in Scotland didn't adopt a very strong European identity, but they did adopt a European uh, identity. We, we have David McCrone has done some work on this. The levels of identification within Europe are, are, are surprisingly high in Scotland. They're just not as high as 
as, as Scottish identity, but, but, but they are there as, as, as well. And the effort to put all the identities back into one box and to say, well, there's this Britishness which consumes just about everything uh, is just going against the way that modern society is evolving. I mean, we're not the only country that's trying to do this. Many European countries are trying to reinvent the nation state. The Americans are going through their own convulsions. But it's not the way that people think, and it's certainly not the way that young people think. As young people are not becoming increasingly nationalistic in the Scottish or the Welsh sense, they're becoming less nationally inclined altogether. Uh, and therefore, would probably be very reluctant to be packed back into those, those, those boxes again. Now, whether it takes support for the EU or a more general pro-Europeanism, that's, that's, that's another question. But certainly that attitude that Scotland is an outward looking place and the United Kingdom is becoming an inward looking place. I, I think that, 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 that sentiment is gonna still be around and influence the way that people think for a good while yet. Interesting question here about intergovernmental relations from Nelly Gerard. What is your take on the future of intergovernment relations inside the UK between devolved governments and the central government? Do you think they will mainly remain ad hoc relations or do you believe more formal mechanisms such as the Joint Ministerial Committee will be enhanced or created? Well, there are two sides to this. One is about the power relationship. And I've argued that we could introduce a kind of federalizing notion that the UK government should be restrained from intervening in devolved matters. It doesn't intervene in devolved matters a great deal until recently, but it always can do. There was always the, the shadow of hierarchy there. The, in any intergovernmental negotiation, UK government said, well, we'd like you to agree, but if you don't, and if you look at all the various consent mechanisms, there are about six now. There's not just the Seoul Convention, there's all kinds of other ones. They all take the same form. We will ask your permission, but if you don't give your permission, we'll go ahead anyway. And they're becoming ex increasingly explicit uh, in, in that, in the UK internal market bill being just uh, the latest one. We'll go ahead anyway. Now, uh, that then affects the whole tenor of negotiations all the way down to official level. You get rid of that and you would have a relationship of equals. Now, everybody says it's all about respect. Well, no doubt it is, but it's about power. Fundamentally, it's about power. Uh, and, and who has the, who, who holds the cards, who holds the Trump card. Take that away and then you can address all the details about intergovernmental committees and joint ministerial committees and, and so on. The other thing about intergovernmental relations is that Whitehall departments generally are not, are not hostile to the devolved levels, to the devolved governments. They just forget about them. Uh, and every few years I'm invited down there uh, to teach Whitehall civil servants about devolution. Uh, the first time was actually in 1976. Uh, yeah, I did say 76 because that was, we thought we were gonna have devolution. I taught a devolution course at the Civil Service College. Uh, and last time I went down, they all have these lanyards, devolution in you and a big mug that they came, gave me to take home. And I said, no, you keep that mug because you're the one that needs to be reminded about these things. Uh, it goes through phases and maybe that's inevitable. You've got big departments there and relatively small departments in the devolved territories, but it is important just that there should be a greater awareness in Whitehall of this. And the later, the, the Dunlop report and other recent developments suggest once again, Whitehall is trying to resensitize itself to remembering the, the existence and the presence and the importance of, of the devolved governments and the devolution as part of the constitution. What do you make, Michael, of the of the union unit? I'm just you, you mentioned Andrew Dunlop's work there, but I'm also aware that Michael Gove is driving a lot of uh, this thinking behind the scenes. Which one's likely to have greater influence on in how the UK government conducts itself? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't want to speculate about personalities. We know they are important, and we know that there is a an argument within the UK government about how to handle what they see as the immediate crisis of of, of Scotland, whether it's simply taking a hard line on no referendum is enough in the hope that it will go away. And maybe it will, but it will come back. Uh, or, or whether an activist presence of the UK and Scotland is appropriate. City deals, uh, leveling up funds, spending money in Scotland, signing a union flag on it. I'm, I'm very skeptical about the, the effects of that. Uh, or devolving to local government, bypassing the Scottish government and so on. These strategies are being played out. They're not new, they, they've all been tried 
uh, before. In the late 19th century, we had in Ireland killing home rule with kindness, which, which worked for a little while, but in the end, it, it, it didn't work at all. Uh, so there are these, there's this uncertainty, and it's really very interesting for a student of unionism to see the way that unionists at the center now challenged are feeling they ought to respond because these do reflect different understandings of the union and unionism as, 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 as practice. How that's going to work out, I don't really know. Uh, the UK parties are greatly weakened these days by the fact they don't have a substantial presence in Scotland. The Conservatives have overtaken the Labour Party, but sorry, they're still very, very weak compared even where they were in Margaret Thatcher's day. And that does affect their ability to read opinion in Scotland, to read the Scottish situation and know how to how to respond. I appreciate you, you've seen these initiatives before, but I, I was struck by the size of the ambition of the recent suggestion that various UK government departments would be decentralised and, and moved not just to, to Scotland, but across England. I can't remember the specifics exactly, but you've got DCMS, I think, going to, to Salford, various other departments moving um, north and even further north to, to our part of the world. Do you, would you say that that is a, a bigger commitment than what we've seen before, or, or are you so cynical that it, there, there's nothing Nothing new in it to uh, appreciate. Cynical me? <laughs> well, uh, yes. Uh, the, this country is very centralised, not just when it comes to political power, but but the activity of, of government. And that's partly because we're not federal. If you go to Germany, you find many of these responsibilities are at least administered by, by the lender, and you get thriving cities right across Germany that maybe, but well, in some respects, do rival Berlin, in case in Frankfurt and Francis services are, are, are more important. We don't have that. And so undoubtedly, this is positive, dispersing these jobs, so the well-paid jobs and, and activity, but it's not dispersing the power if they're still answering to, to the center. Uh, just as the Scottish office in its day was not home rule, it was not devolution, it was government from the center. Uh, and to be really cynical, uh, <laughs> Uh, these initiatives have occurred in several European countries. Uh, in Ireland, they were doing it a lot in the 1990s and the 2000s. And somehow, most people seem to manage to make their way back to Dublin again. Um, uh, so it does, it does require a degree of commitment of the government to do that. But, but, but obviously, this is, this is positive from the point of view of economic development and for, for more effective government to have these jobs dispersed. I mean, that's been one strong theme I've seen in the past few months is this desire. Um, and we've yet to see whether it bears fruit to, to decentralise out of, of Westminster. But another is really to um, try and talk up the strength of the union. We've got a question here from Professor Nicola McEwen, who says the UK government is keen to talk up the strength of the union to confront big challenges like COVID, for example, with furlough, vaccination procurement, etc. How much do you think COVID governance could reinforce the ethos of the union? Or does the current administration's tendency to shout about the strength of the union and wrap it in a union flag paradoxically weaken the union? Um, pro pro probably the latter. Uh, because one of the things that I noticed just walking around Edinburgh where I live are all these union flags uh, and all these COVID health messages saying UK government in Scotland. <laughs> Why are they doing that? Uh, clearly it's just, a, it's, it's, it's just a little bit of the credit. Uh, for, for whatever is, is happening there. Uh, and similarly, the, the vaccination, uh, the vaccination is, is a joint effort. Uh, COVID management has worked best when it has been jointly managed uh, rather than uh, when there's rivalry and, and a lack of cooperation. But if you take credit when things are going well, as they are with the vaccination, and try not to take credit when they weren't going so well as with the earlier lockdowns, and then you discover that uh, you're going to get blamed for things that aren't your fault. You take all the credit, you've got to take all the blame uh, uh, as well. And one reason why governments across the world like to decentralize, central governments, is that it actually gives them more independence. It's what was called central autonomy. I, I worked on France in the 1980s, and the French government said, we're going to decentralize to the localities, to the cities and the regions, so that they can take responsibility and don't go knocking on our doors when anything, everything goes wrong. So they could be setting themselves up for real trouble. Uh, and if they're taking credit for all the big decisions, then what is to stop the Scottish government just saying, well, yeah, it was their fault. 
these things are their fault. So that doesn't, that, that I think is what Nicola is getting at. It does undermine devolution, it doesn't undermine the, the logic of devolution, which is about governments taking responsibility for the things for which they are constitutionally responsible. I think it links neatly back to your earlier point about unionism becoming a nationalism rather than, than a mode of government. Two more questions here, um, which are very specific about how government functions. And then, Michael, I'm going to end with a, a much larger existential question for you, just to, to get you thinking before everybody goes and has their tea. But the, the first of those very detailed questions comes from Gordon Downey. He says, will the development of framework agreements help to establish an EU directive style regime which allows for flexibility at a subunion level? It, it could do, uh, uh, as long as they're properly designed. Now, they, the frameworks I, agreements I've, I've, I've read, the ones that have been published are, are really a bit of a dog's breakfast. Some of them are extremely long in detail. Some of them say very little. Uh, there's no, seems to be no logic, no coherence uh, to this notion of what a framework is, what should be in it, and how it should be administered. And that's very different from the way that EU, EU law Uh, but it gives discretion to the various governments and, and, and it's data to the Scottish government as well, because the Scottish government used to have all the discretion of a member state in relation to devolved matters. And the frameworks I've seen just don't seem to correspond to any coherent logic whatsoever. Uh, and some governments, some departments seem to have taken them seriously and, and, and others haven't. So what I suggest is that there should be a template, there should be an understanding of what a framework is, just as there should be an understanding of what consent means, rather than having half a dozen different mechanisms scattered all over the place. Uh, and then within that, there should be a principle that frameworks are negotiated, that they're agreed, that they're not imposed from on, on high. With that, with those things in place, then the frameworks could be a very useful element for managing the union. Very much a, a connected question here from Jenny Dunsmore, who says an independent UK trade policy will significantly impact devolved issues, but the internal structures in the UK for Westminster oversight and devolved government's role is very weak. Do you think the current arrangements are somewhat fixed or are they still evolving? Well, that's a very important one because many of the things that were previously dealt with by European law will now become part of international negotiations, including the agreement with the EU itself. Uh, and we don't really know how that will work out and be enforced with regard to devolved matters. We don't know how it's going to work out and be enforced with regard to reserved matters either, for that matter. It's, it's all very vague. Uh, but similarly, trade negotiations with other countries will impinge on devolved matters. And international trade negotiations these days are much more than just about trade in the sense of tariffs and customs duties. They're about regulation. They're about environmental standards. They're about the so-called flanking measures. Uh, they're about all kinds of things that overspill into devolved areas. And we haven't really got a clear answer as to how is that's going to be handled, except the UK government says it will consult with the devolves. Uh, but maybe consultation is, is not enough. Maybe we need something more than that, because in relation to European matters, we had the Joint uh, Ministerial Committee on Europe uh, there are mixed opinions about this, but at least this provided a formal framework uh, in which these matters could be discussed before the UK went to the European Council. Uh, we need at least something like that with regard to international trade agreements. The absolute minimum uh, that should be expected. So we are uh, 60 minutes through there, Michael. So I've got one, one more question for you before we, before we wrap up. And uh, it's from Violet again, and she says, many economic theories suggest that the future of political influence on government will be transferred to how big business controls the economic structures in any country in the world. How does this link to the topic of the union? So, so there's a big one for you. None of this really matters because big business has all the power anyway. Well, big business has a great deal of power. That's, that's undeniable to have economic power, but they also depend on government as well. And businesses also always complain about regulation in the abstract, but they like regulation in the particular because they depend on it to create the conditions in which business can, 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 can work. Uh, this is something that's not really being given sufficient attention in, in Scotland in the debate about Scottish independence. What kind of economic model will we have? 
how can we make our independence, if we were to become independent, real in, in the sense, in, in an interdependent world, or will we be just buffeted by international economic trends? Very little, little about that, just the assumption that somehow you can become sovereign and then you can pull the levers. That, that, that is a debate that needs to be engaged. It's not just big business uh, either, it's, it's small and, and medium-sized businesses. Right? We're not particularly good in Scotland with, with medium-sized businesses. So the whole economic model really needs to be rethought and the role of government in relation to the economy before we can talk about Scotland governing its own affairs. It's not just a matter of constitutional tinkering. It's also a matter of the of economic regulation. I think it's uh, fair to say that um, a legitimate critique of the current Scottish Parliament election campaign is that the real lack of debate around economic policy, uh, how to stimulate economic growth, what to what to do with tax receipts. It's, it's, we are generally pretty served quite poorly by debates around the, the economy and what we need to do yeah. to grow it. Michael, that's been a, a fabulous 60 minutes uh, discussing your new book, State and Nation in the United Kingdom, uh, The Fractured Union. And as you mentioned earlier, there's the full Oxford Dictionary definition of a fracture on the inside cover. Uh, the full book is due to be published on the 24th of April at the bargain price, I think, of £70, Michael. <laughs> so, so look out for the, the e-book yeah. version uh, coming very soon. And all that's left for me to say is thank you to everyone for tuning in and also to encourage you all to keep your eye on the Centre on Constitutional Change's website for any future events. But that's all from us. Bye for now. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. <laughs>